Welcome to the Cincinnati Eye Institute and to Cincinnati, for those of you who haven't been here. My name is Anoop Katana. I'm a glaucoma specialist here. I grew up in Detroit, did most of my schooling and training there. I did my fellowship at Wills. I was on the faculty and in practice in Kansas City for four years before I came here in 2000. We pride ourselves on being able to provide literally full spectrum care for glaucoma. We perform every single currently approved glaucoma procedure. I've been doing the trabectome now for probably six years. You know, as with any new procedure, there was always a little bit of you know, trepidation, wondering is this really, you know, does it really work? How will it work in my hand, et cetera? And so uh, I'll try to sort of walk you guys through that as we go along. So Dr. George Barvelt there was the inventor um, of the trabectome. It's indications for use of surgical management of adult and infantile glaucoma. And the beauty of this is it's not limited, for example, like the eye stent is to open angle mild to moderate glaucoma. You know, there really aren't any off-label uses for the trabectome per se. It's been approved here for over 10 years. Just a brief review of the angle anatomy. We have Schwalbe's line here, um, scleral spur, trabecular meshwork there, and then the anterior face of the ciliary body right here. Just a histopath view, you can see Schwalbe's line, trabecular meshwork, Schlem's canal, um, scleral spur, and then the anterior face of the ciliary body. Schlem's canal is about 350 microns in diameter. The primary resistance to outflow is the juxtacanalicular um, tissue and the inner wall of Schlem's canal. There are about eight large collector channels in, in most patients. Most important to note is that the majority of them uh, have been found to be present in the inferior nasal uh, part of the eye. You, know, you definitely want to try to make sure that you are accessing the infranasal quadrant uh, of Schlem's canal when you're doing angle surgery. And this is a, a, a latex uh, study that uh, just shows um, how rich the collector channels are. This is a right eye um, down in the infranasal quadrant. Blood reflux in Schlem's is a, a really nice tool um, when you're doing angle surgery to make it easy to see your landmarks, especially in eyes that have a very lightly or non-pigmented trabecular meshwork. Sometimes it can be really hard to, to tell what's what. The trabectome system itself uh, with the console and the foot pedal, you've got these are basically modified Swan Jacobs lenses um, that come in both a right-handed and a left-handed uh, version. You've got the, the handpiece, the fluidix tubing, the tray drape, the uh, knife, uh, which is a 1.8 millimeter keratome, and the cannula. So you'll see that there is the uh, irrigation ports right here, the aspiration ports right here. This is the active electrode, that's the return or passive electrode, and then here's the insulated foot plate. This insulated foot plate protects the outer wall of Schlem's canal as you're performing the, the procedure. And as you're doing it, it's really easy in the beginning to go too deep and also ablate or remove the outer wall of Schlem's canal. You don't want to do that. And you, you, you might ask, well, why not? What difference does it make you know, if, you, if you leave the outer wall or not because you still have the openings to the collector channels present? Well, the problem is when you've removed you know, basement membranes and, and the, 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 uh, the lining cells, what happens, you get an inflammatory response and you scar. And so you're more likely to obliterate the openings to the ostea, to the collector channels, if you remove the outer wall as well. Here you've got the, the probe inside Schlem's canal. You happen to see a couple little areas of collector channels where you're getting a teeny little bit of reflux. With the uh, improved irrigation or infus infusion system that they now use, it's really rare that you'll see blood reflux immediately actively while you're doing it because the IOP is usually high enough to prevent that. Um, and um, you know, in the beginning, one other thing you could try doing if, let's say, you start doing it, but you're not sure that you're in the right place or you just want a little confirmation that you're in the right place, you can always turn the infusion off. And 
let the eye soften and see if you get reflux. And if you do, you know you're in the right place. Uh, the inter intact TM, uh, unroofed uh, inner wall of Schlem's canal, and you can see the collector channel ostium right here. Before the trabectome, you can see a normal appearing angle. And after trabectome, here on UBM and on histopath, you can see how the uh, Schlems has been unroofed. Moving on to the procedure itself, you know, positioning and setup, it says similar to FACO patient setup, yes, you're going to sit temporally, et cetera. Here they're saying tilt the microscope toward the surgeon 30 degrees. Honestly, I tilt it to the max that it goes, which is 45 degrees. And I'll also tilt the patient's head. Some patients will perform, or some doctors will perform the surgery with topical anesthesia. I don't like to do that. I like to have a block so I have complete control over the eye. For me, granted, there are some risks with doing a block, but those risks are really small. And I think that the safety margin is going to be way higher if you've done a block rather than letting ego take over and say, oh, well, I can do this case topically. I like to have things tilted so much that I'm literally coming in uh, flat and parallel just above the iris. Okay, I don't want any angle at all coming down to it, so I know exactly where I am. Now, one way that you may not have to tilt the patient's head at all or so much is um, if you use the, the TVG, the Transcend Volt Gonial Lens, which has a, like a Thornton uh, type of fixation ring on it that allows you to be able to torque the eye nasally. Um, and still allow enough clearance for the incision, the corneal incision, to be able to take instruments in and out. The problem with using that, and I wouldn't recommend it, in fact, I've never used that lens for this procedure, is you're applying more external pressure to the eye, and you're more likely to get blood reflux as you're doing it. So the steps, the first step is 1.8 millimeter uh, clear corneal incision inserting the gonial lens. In the beginning, I would put the gonial lens on to make sure that everything was lined up. I don't anymore. Basically, I've been doing it long enough. I know where and how everything needs to be, so I'll just go ahead and get everything ready. I'll insert the, the, the probe into the eye and then put the gonial lens on. Step three, you're going to ablate and then uh, you know, irrigate and aspirate. Uh, they talk about suturing, but frankly, it's rare that um, uh, these incisions need suturing. When you first start doing the surgery, I would definitely recommend just making a standard clear corneal tunnel incision with a 1.8. And remember, the longer your tunnel is, the more watertight it'll be, the less reflux you're going to get, the less leaking you're going to get out of the incision. Once you get more experienced, and, and we'll talk about this more, uh, we'll talk about flaring the inner lip, which you'll see in one of the videos. So you'll come across to the left, turn it around, enter where you already started, and then come around to the right. When you're entering the meshwork, this is probably the, the trickiest part or one of the trickiest parts of the, the procedure. Step one is advancing the probe all the way across the angle and seeing the probe touch the trabecular meshwork. So you've got visual contact uh, with the meshwork or visual confirmation of contact. Then you're going to apply some pressure and gently compress the trabecular meshwork and Schlem's canal. So you're sort of uh, dimpling that tissue there. Next is you're going to then uh, slide it over to the left so that you can actually enter Schlem's canal. And then once you're in, you'll slowly advance it uh, as we talked about. And essentially, you want to aim for the middle third of the trabecular meshwork. This is the, the second tricky part of doing this. Uh, just out of curiosity, how many of you have ever flown a plane? Yeah. Okay. Um, I flew a plane once for like 20 minutes when I was a freshman in college, one of those introductory things. And um, the one thing you don't really realize when you're flying in a small plane is how really in, in three, you know, three dimensions in space, you know, the whole plane is turning when you're doing the turning rather than just sitting in the back of a, you know, of a big jet. 
Um, you know, you're not just turning in two dimensions, you're turning in three dimensions. So the same is sort of true here. As you're advancing, Schlem's canal is curved, it's circular, okay? So you can't just, uh, you know, advance the probe in a straight line. The probe has to follow the curve of Schlem's canal. What that means is to prevent the probe from uh, going through the outer wall and potentially even into sclera, you have to figure out how to follow that curve and you have to move the, the probe to the left and withdraw it at the same time. Think of the corneal incision as a fulcrum so that as the, the inner part of the probe is moving to the left, you want to think in your mind of moving the handpiece part or the proximal part of the probe to the right, okay? And sort of pulling it back a little bit as you're doing that. What he's doing is flaring the inner lip, as you see. By flaring the inner lip of the incision, what that'll allow you to do is get a wider treatment arc, so you're able to ablate more of the angle. And I, sorry? You get more play. Exactly. Um, and I have seen, uh, sl I think, slightly lower IOP results um, after I started uh, flaring the lip. But as I said, when you first start doing it, don't flare the lip. As you saw, he decompressed the eye to allow blood to reflux in, and then it's like a nice landing strip with lights that makes it really easy to know exactly where you are. This is Dr. Minkler doing a, a straight uh, trabectome and a phagic eye. Um, when I do phagic trabectomes, which are few and far between, the one thing I do is I'll inject some myocol or myostat to, to get meiosis and protect the lens. And you can see that uh, once um, he's in, he's just slowly coming along. Typically what I'll do is I'll sort of count in my mind that I want to have at least a count of five per clock hour. So, you know, one, two, and sort of a slow count. One, two, three, four, five for one clock hour, or per clock hour as I'm going along. Once the um, surgery is done, just hydrating, um, he puts an incision in. Like I said, I don't do that anymore. Uh, this is uh, trabectome combined with phaco and um, there are rare cases where it may be easier to do the uh, trabectome at the end after the phaco, but for the majority of cases, I'll typically do it before and we'll talk about why later. So once you've gone all the way across to the left and there was an area where you didn't feel like he had completely ablated the tissue, so he sort of backed up and um, went back over that area, turning it around. entering where he started. Now, this is really important. Sometimes you're not able to get a good ablation. You can see this is almost more like a cleavage plane. You want to try to go slow enough that you're getting that ablation. Otherwise, it's almost like a goniotomy and those areas of the cleft are more likely to close back up. I, I get that also occasionally, and if I do, what I'll do is I'll, I'll come out and I will, you know, maybe sort of move ahead a half or a whole clock hour and create a new entry so that I can try to start and getting a, get a good clean ablation. And once I've done that, then I'll turn back around and try to uh, sort of uh, clean up that intervening gap uh, with ablation coming from the other side. Now, um, the operating microscope, um, you know, I'm amazed that we have Leicas downstairs and I love the Leica scopes. One of the features I love about them is the, how easy it is to tilt the scope. Um, all the others, it's, it's amazing that in 2016 you, you still literally have to, you know, crank, 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 crank to get the microscope to tilt like you see him doing here. Um, and um, it's just so cumbersome. But 
it's worth spending the extra time to get the patient positioning and everything just right. And the other thing to also always keep in mind is your own ergonomics, you know, making sure that you're not in an awkward position um, as you're doing it. So um, take that time, make sure you're comfortable and everything is situated and stable. Because your first several cases are going to take longer, and the longer they take, you're going to fatigue. So if you're comfortable, you're not going to fatigue as quickly. And you can see how slowly he's going. Do you see what I meant about the angle there? Did everyone see how th this one, he was not completely flat and parallel to the iris. He was sort of coming down, and it was a lot harder to, um, you know, to see exactly the, uh, the landmarks. Let me find this. Just kind of back this up a little bit. You see how some eyes, it's really easy to see, um, but it's, it's pretty hard because of the angle that, uh, uh, the angle of the view, um, things weren't tilted enough. And the more you tilt it, as you'll see, especially uh, with the live surgeries I'll do today, uh, I'll try to demonstrate what a difference it makes having that extra bit of angling. Post-operative care, similar to a FACO, uh, one day, one week, one month, although it's not always quite cookbook, uh, you know, like that. I'll base it uh, depending on how the eye is doing, and we'll get more into that later. I, I like to use pilocarpine, I put a drop in at the end of the case, and then have them start pilocarpine day one. Um, usually 1%, um, anywhere from BID to QID, depending on the iris color um, for uh, anywhere from one to three months. Antibiotic for a week, steroids. Lodamax is my preference, and we'll talk more about this later. If you need to, if the pressure is not quite ideal, you may need to resume glaucoma medications uh, while the eye is healing and then gradually wean them off. Talking about some of the data that's out there, this was from um, Dr. Mossad, who's in the same department as Dr. Barvelt at UC Irvine. They looked at the first decade of all their outcomes. They had almost 4,700 surgeries. That's a lot of surgeries. Now, this is not just their department. This was all surgeons um, because the first year that you perform the surgery, they require that you submit all your follow-up um, you know, for them. Uh, one, so they can monitor new surgeons' uh, outcomes to see if they're having an issue, they can try to help them, which is really great. Very few companies will do that. And number two, it gave them a ready pool of data to be able to analyze and present. The uh, post-operative IOPs that you can see here are really remarkable. What's really remarkable is how consistent they were. This is 84, 90 months. What's also interesting, and I don't have a good explanation for this, is how the number of glaucoma medications gradually dropped um, over that same period of time. The survival curves are interesting because, uh, and we see this uh, in the real world, that trabectome plus FACO works better and longer than trabectome alone. Actually, probably less than 1% of the trabectome cases I do are standalone trabectomes. Most of them are FACO trabectomes. Notable here is that 4% of the trabectome eyes ended up requiring a trabeculectomy afterwards, and 2% uh, ended up getting a tube. There were no cases of you know, aqueous misdirection. No, While well, there were 10 cases of sustained hypotony that were one month post-op, 49 cases, or 1% at one day post-op. Here's trabectome compared to FACO alone, and this is just one surgeon's experience. Here are the uh, FACO alone patients. You can see 
that uh, they did get a drop in their IOP compared to baseline of maybe a point or two, which is our typical experience. And that will last for, uh, in this case, it only lasted for about seven or eight months. There are some studies that have shown that that reduction in IOP can last up to two years. Obviously, everyone's experience varies. On the other hand, the phacotrabectome group, uh, a statistically significantly lower IOP, and that reduction in IOP was maintained. Same thing with the survival curves. You can see phacotrabectome 80% at 25 months, FACO alone down to 45% at 25 months. These are open angle glaucoma patients, multiple uh, three surgeons, again comparing trabectome and FACO to trabectome alone. To, to do a fair comparison, if you look at the trabectome and FACO group, their pre-op IOP average was 20. The trabectome alone average pre-op IOP was around 26, 27. The magnitude of the drop in pressure was actually greater in the trabectome alone group. Percentage-wise, it was probably a little bit greater in the trabectome alone group compared to the phaco trabectome. At least some of the eyes that we're doing straight trabectomes on are patients who not only have a higher pressure, but are patients that we want a lower pressure than we may necessarily uh, be looking for for someone that we're doing a phaco with. If you do a trab on a patient, you're looking for a pressure of you know, no higher than 12 to 14 afterwards, maybe lower. If you got a pressure of 18, like this group did, you're gonna think, ah, that didn't work so well, right? But compared to where you started, it was a, a significant drop in IOP. Was it where they needed to be? Maybe, maybe not. That helps to sort of put things in perspective. The number of meds also decreased down from about two and a half to about 1.7 or so in the trabectome and phaco group, went from about 2.8, 2.9 in the trabectome alone to two in the uh, afterwards. Survival curve in this study, about 87% in the trabectome phaco group at 12 months compared to only 65% in the trabectome alone. Also, what's notable here is in this definition of success, no additional glaucoma surgery and IOP reduction greater than or equal to 20% and an IOP less than 21. As I had touched on earlier, the trabectome standalone, you know, as far as success rates, uh, are those success rates maybe lower because these are patients with more advanced damage, patients who need a lower pressure compared to the trabectome and phaco patients? It's really fascinating how we do see, uh, seem to see lower IOPs in the phacotrabectome group. There seems to be a synergistic effect when you add the phaco to it that's not just additive. Probably a phacomorphic component. Well, not necessarily, but if it was phacomorphic, that's a great question. There are studies that have looked at the amount of IOP reduction just from phaco alone, okay? And what those studies have seen is eyes that have, that start out with a nice open angle pre-op in a phacic state are less likely to get an IOP reduction and get a lower magnitude of IOP reduction. Eyes that start out with a narrow angle and widen significantly afterwards, those are the eyes where you get the most bang for your buck from FACO alone. In this, you know, in this uh, group of patients, I don't think that anyone's really looked at that. Another study looking at pseudoexfoliation compared to open angle glaucoma, trabectome alone versus trabectome and FACO. Here you've got POAG, trabectome alone, trabectome and FACO, and you can see the curves and the numbers on these are pretty much identical to the earlier graphs that I'd shown you. Even the, the pre-op IOPs were, you know, around just over 25 in the trabectome alone, right around 20 in the trabectome and phaco group. Exfoliation, they were a little bit higher, closer to 30 in the, uh, the trabectome alone group and about 22 in the combined group. In both of them, the IOP reduction was significant, but the magnitude of reduction of IOP was greater in the pseudoexfoliation group compared to POAG. Looking at the survival curves, here is pseudoexfoliation. 
Here is POAG and the trabectome alone group. So survival curve is better in pseudoexfoliation with trabectome alone. But interestingly, in the combined trabectome FACO, they were pretty similar. Although it looks like the POAG was a little bit better, this difference was not statistically significant. In both groups, the pressure gets down into the teens. You do get not only a better reduction in IOP, but more of a reduction in the number of medications with pseudoexfoliation. Your goal is less than 12 when you skip past yeah, um, yeah, we'll talk about patient selection, but typically if someone needs a pressure below 12, I will always, almost never consider a trabectome, with rare exceptions. Secondary glaucoma is also an interesting study. This is the uh, percent of IOP reduction in the blue or gray, and uh, this is a number of medication uh, reduction. Here's POAG about a 25% drop in IOP, a 40-something percent drop in meds. Here's pseudoexfoliation, a little bit better than POAG. Uveitics, as expected, not a, a huge drop, but a modest reduction in IOP. Steroid-induced, this was fascinating to me because eyes with trabectomes get big steroid responses, which we'll talk about. And so the fact that Trabectome did lower pressure in eyes with steroid-induced glaucoma uh, is fascinating. Normal tension was actually comparable to pseudoexfoliation as far as the percent of uh, 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 med reduction, but the IOP reduction was definitely less. And uh, ocular hypertension, similar to NTG. Dysgenetic, this is as we would expect. This had the greatest percent of IOP drop why? These eyes have abnormal angles. And if you're talking about congenital or juvenile glaucoma, you know, they often have that Barkhans membrane uh, across the trabecular meshwork in the angle, and that's why goniotomy works in these eyes. And that's essentially what we're doing here, just ab interno. Another really fascinating study looking at eyes that went, underwent a trabectome after already having had a failed trabeculectomy. Normally, we don't think in terms of that sequence. We think once someone has had a TRAB, you're not going to go backwards and do a MIGS procedure. Well, think again. There were 81 eyes in this study. And um, here's what you see. Uh, this is uh, trabectome alone. This is phaco trabectome. All these eyes had previously failed trabeculectomies. Here was the pre-op IOP. Here is the post-op IOP. Here is the number of medications pre and post. Here is the phacotrabectome. Pretty darn close and similar to eyes that had not had a previous trabeculectomy, which is also fascinating. And the survival plots, these are actually better with the straight trabectome compared to the previous studies that we had seen. Not sure why that is. We've got medications, laser, surgery, um, you know, we'll, we'll say a trabeculectomy or some variation thereof, uh, and then tube shunts or implants. So where does trabectome fit in? Traditionally, it would be before we consider a trabeculectomy. And there are some eyes where we might consider it prior to laser, if we happen to be doing cataract surgery at the same time. When you add in the issues of allergy, potential cost of medications, compliance, et cetera, could we potentially look at a paradigm shift where we might consider it even prior to medications? And certainly after failed trabeculectomy, as we just touched on. And what about the presence of Sinichi, the uh, narrow angle and yes. all of these we'll, things? We'll, we'll talk about all that. Okiki said the cost of glaucoma meds Absolutely. is totally prohibited, and the generics are not as efficient. I have my experience is about 30% of them simply fail mm -hmm. to lower the IOP. In fact, when they have had the brand name and go to generic, there is a drop of about 30%. In my experience. Yep. No, I mean I, I agree that you know generics are very inconsistent. Um, and it's hard to know. And even the cost of generics has gone up so much yeah, that they're not necessarily that much cheaper anymore.